I've always been fascinated by this little lantern that shines so brightly. One question that always sparked my curiosity was how the fuel travels from the bottom of the lantern to the top without a wick or motor. And what's the deal with that mysterious white ball inside? Some even believe it's radioactive. A few days ago, my curiosity got the better of me, and I decided to take a deep dive into how this pressure lantern really works. What I discovered absolutely blew my mind. The physics behind it are truly incredible. I couldn't wait to share everything I learned with you in this video. I'll also be answering some burning questions like, are those mantles radioactive? How long does the lantern glow on a full tank? Why does it need a pump to get started? And what's behind its quirky startup process? So, without further ado, let's dive in and explore the fascinating world of this clever little lantern together. Before the advent of electricity, pressure lamps were a popular source of illumination. These lamps, which used pressurized kerosene, provided a reliable and bright light for homes, streets, and public spaces. We'll start our journey from the very bottom of the lantern and work our way up to the top, uncovering the secrets behind its brilliant glow. At the base of the lantern lies the fuel tank, which serves as the main reservoir for the fuel, usually kerosene. It's specially designed to store the fuel under pressure, powering the lantern's bright glow. Fuel is added to the lamp through a side cap and stored in a cylindrical fuel tank. To overcome gravity and help the fuel rise, the lantern relies on pressure. This pressure is generated by a pump assembly inside the reservoir. The assembly includes a hollow tube with a handle, a cap that secures it to the lantern, a return spring to smooth the pumping action, and a leather or plastic pump cup that creates a seal inside the pump cylinder. This pump cup is held in place by a backing plate and a nut. To prevent backflow of pumped air into the pump, a check valve is threaded into the tank. It incorporates a small check ball that allows airflow only in one direction, that is downwards into the fuel reservoir. The air stem provides an extra layer of sealing for the air within the reservoir. Its pointed tip fits into the check valve, acting like a plug. Turning the pump handle clockwise seals the check valve, while turning it counterclockwise allows air to flow through. Before pressurizing the fuel tank, it's important to understand how to maintain that pressure. The fuel tank has three points that must be sealed to keep it airtight. The first is the pump, which is sealed by the check valve. The second is where the lantern's fuel valve enters the tank from the top. This connection is threaded to ensure a secure, airtight seal. The third is the opening where fuel is added, which is sealed with a heavy rubber gasket inside the fuel filler cap. Once the fuel valve is in place, the fuel filler cap is tightened, and the check valve is closed, the fuel tank becomes completely airtight. To use the lantern, begin by turning the pump handle counterclockwise. Place your thumb over the small hole in the handle and start pumping. For better clarity, let's isolate the pump assembly and take a closer look at how it functions. As you pull the pump back, a vacuum forms beneath the pump cup, causing outside air to flow over the pump cup to fill the created vacuum. During this process, the check valve prevents air from being drawn out of the fuel reservoir. When the pump is fully extended, fresh air completely fills the space between the pump cup and the check valve. As you begin pushing the pump inward, the pressure inside the pump cylinder increases. This increased pressure pushes the check ball downward, opening the valve and allowing air to flow into the fuel reservoir. During this inward motion, the pump cup expands outward against the pump cylinder, creating an airtight seal. This ensures that air is forced into the fuel reservoir, gradually pressurizing it as you continue pumping. Typically, after about 25 pumps, the fuel reservoir becomes sufficiently pressurized for smooth operation. Once the lantern is fully pressurized, return the pump to its bottom position and rotate it clockwise to close. This action seals the air stem, providing an additional lock for the check valve. The next component we need to focus on is the fuel and air tube. This device delivers fuel from the fuel tank to the fuel valve. You'll notice a small hole on this fuel tube that allows air to flow upwards from the fuel tank. Inside the fuel and air tube, there is a metering rod and a spring. When in its resting position, 
the metering rod does not obstruct the flow of fuel. However, when the metering rod is pressed down, it blocks the hole in the fuel and air tube, thereby stopping the flow of fuel through it. The position of the metering rod is controlled by the valve stem. Rotating the valve stem clockwise moves it into the valve body, pushing the metering rod downward and blocking the flow of fuel through the fuel and air tube. Conversely, rotating the valve stem counterclockwise causes it to move out of the valve body, releasing the pressure on the metering rod, which then moves upward, allowing fuel to flow through the fuel and air tube and into the valve body. The next fascinating component is the generator, which functions like the heart of the pressure lantern. The generator comprises a gas tip, a spring that acts as a filler, and a cleaning rod. The top end of the cleaning rod has a needle-like structure that cleans the gas tip when pushed upward. The position of the cleaning rod is controlled by the tip cleaning stem, which is connected to the valve body. The cleaning rod and the tip cleaning stem are linked through an eccentric block, allowing the rotation of the cleaning stem to clean the gas tip. The primary role of the generator is to convert liquid fuel into vapor fuel. This process is crucial in pressure lanterns as it allows the fuel to burn more efficiently, resulting in a brighter light, which distinguishes pressure lanterns from regular wick-type lanterns. You might be wondering, where does the generator get the heat to convert the liquid fuel into vapor? To answer this, let's look at two different scenarios. When the lantern is running, the combustion of fuel inside the mantle produces enough heat to power the generator, converting liquid fuel into vapor fuel and keeping the system running smoothly. But this raises an intriguing question. How does the generator get the heat it needs to start when the lantern is initially off? After all, the lantern relies entirely on vaporized fuel to function. This is where things get interesting. There are three primary methods to preheat the generator and kickstart the lantern. The first and the most common is to open the valve for a few seconds so that a small amount of liquid fuel is sprayed onto the mantle due to the pressurized fuel in the tank. Then, you simply light it with a matchstick. The burning fuel provides enough energy to heat the generator. The second method is to use some alcohol and burn it to heat up the generator. The third, more traditional method is to use a cloth swab with a flame to heat the generator. These are the different methods to preheat the generator and start the lantern. The generated fuel vapor is then introduced into the mixing chamber, where it combines with fresh air drawn in through a hole located at the bottom of the chamber. This mixing of air and fuel vapor is crucial for creating the proper air-to-fuel ratio needed for efficient combustion. The air-fuel mixture then enters the U-tube, a crucial component with two primary functions. The U-tube features a choke point, where the inside diameter of the burner passage narrows considerably. This section, called the venturi, increases the velocity of the air-fuel mixture as it passes through. As the mixture is redirected by 180 degrees in the U-tube, a vortex is created, causing the mixture to spiral downward toward the mantle at a higher speed, enhancing combustion efficiency. Next, the air-fuel mixture passes through the burner tube and burner cap. The burner tube is just an extension of the mixing chamber, while the burner cap helps to hold mantle. The overall dimensions of the mixing chamber, U-tube and burner tube, are precisely engineered to supply the right portion of air-fuel mixture to the mantle. Finally, we arrive at the mantle, the key component of the lantern responsible for producing bright, incandescent white light when heated by a flame. The mantle is a pear-shaped fabric bag made from materials like silk, artificial silk, or rayon. Its fibers are impregnated with metallic salts. When first exposed to flame, the fibers burn away in seconds, leaving behind a brittle ceramic oxide shell that retains the shape of the original fabric. This shell glows brightly, emitting visible light while producing minimal infrared radiation. The bright light emitted is not from fire itself, but from the mantle's glowing oxide structure. In the past, mantles were treated with thorium and cerium nitrates. With thorium, a radioactive metal known for its high melting point, providing the incandescence. However, modern mantles are non-radioactive and are impregnated with a solution of yttrium, erbium, 
and zirconium, providing the same glowing effect without the risks of radioactivity. With just a full tank of 0.2 gallons, or 0.75 liters, the lantern burns for an impressive 9 to 10 hours, filling the darkness with a steady, unwavering brilliance. If you're curious about science, hit that subscribe button and get ready for a wave of fascinating videos to spark your curiosity.